five o'clock. I'm going to call this council meeting to order and um, ask that the clerk please call the roll. Council member Hussein. Here. Council member Wood. Council member Spitzley. Here. Council member Spadafore. Uh, present. Council member Dunbar. Council member Garza. Here. Council member Jackson. Present. Council member Betts. Present. Seven present. Thank you. I'll keep an eye out for council member Dunbar. Okay, so the first thing on our agenda is the minutes um, for August 10th, uh, Vice President Hussein. Sure, President Spadafore, I'd move the August 10th meeting minutes as presented. Proper motion, is um, any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll. Council member Hussein? Yes. Council member Wood? Yes. Council member Spitzley? Yes. Council member Spanafore? Yes. Council member Garza? Jeremy, you're muted. Council member Jackson? Yes. Council member Betts? Yes. I and think Council Jeremy Garza, has something did you say to... yes? Kathy Dunbar is present now. I oh, will give her a second. Jeremy's still muted. I, I can't hear him. I see him talking. Blame it on the Zoom glitch that's going around town. Councilmember Dunbar, how do you vote on the adoption of the August 10th minutes? I would say yes. Very good. Um, and I don't know where Councilmember Garza went. He, he dropped out of the meeting. Oh, I'll put him back in. There we go. Okay, so I was a yes vote for whatever reason, right before I voted, my screen went white. Very good. Well, that I think uh, Sherry concludes the eight people voting yes on the minutes. So we'll move on with the controversial part of the meeting to the public comment on agenda items. Um, with public comment uh, for agenda items, folks, you will please raise your hand. Um, you do that with the, um, on a, um, on a Mac or a PC, uh, the options to do that are, I had to open up my, my cheat sheet because I haven't said this in a while, option Y on a Mac, Alt Y on a Windows computer, or if you're dialing in from the phone, it's star nine. You can also open up the participants window and click on the raise hand button. Uh, we have one person who's raised uh, their hand and after that person is done speaking, uh, we will close the public comment for agenda items. So if you wish to speak, please raise your hand now or forever hold your peace. Uh, Mr. Decker, I see your hand went up and down. We're gonna, we'll, I'm gonna assume you wanna speak. I've, I've had a couple of emails from you. So I know that you're, you're interested in one of the agenda items. So first up is Chris Umflett. Um, sorry, Chris, if I got that name incorrect. You are the first person to speak. Um, I, you have now have permission to speak. Please unmute yourself. And then Sherry will start the clock um, accordingly. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, my name is Chris Umplett. I've lived in the Frandora Hills neighborhood for about eight years. And during that time, worked hard and uh, we've made financial sacrifices in order to pay off our mortgage early. And we are earmarking the cash flow that will be freed up in a few years to do things like catch up on retirement savings, save up for a car that's worth more than $5,000 and help with our kids' college funds. And it's been very disappointing to see that a big chunk of that cash flow is going to go towards paying for the drain work that benefits a lot of people outside of our neighborhood. We believe we should bear some of the cost, but not so much. And it's been more disappointing that we've really had to go out of our way to gather information from news articles, calling the drain commission office, making calls and emails to the city council mayor's office that don't always get returned. And we haven't had, at least as far as we can tell, proactive communication made to us. Uh, it feels like 
this has been done behind our back. And so we would like to work more interactively with the mayor's office and the council to discuss this. And we're asking that you would postpone the vote on this resolution. Thank you very much. Um, next, we will hear from Tim Whalen, followed by Dan Decker. Um, Tim Whalen, you are now permitted to speak if you'd unmute your mic. And Sherry, please start the timer. Hello. All right. Um, hoping you can hear me now. Um, can, I yes. thought I'd be home by now, but I'm in the car. Here's um, my two cents, very similar to Chris. Um, we've tried really hard to uh, to get information and, and try to figure out what's going on. And I feel like uh, Dan and Chris have been putting in a lot of hours trying to figure out this um, whole situation. So we've really had to, and I've had a couple uh, points of contact go unresponded to, um, which I, I get COVID a little bit crazy, but yeah, I mean, it's a pretty significant, seems like a pretty significant um, increase to our taxes that we'd be experiencing. And to, to Chris's point, feel like the benefits um, to our neighborhood specifically are are pretty small in proportion to the community at large and then especially the the sections that um, will be benefiting from it in the Frandor Shopping Center and and uh, and other than that so my thoughts today are you know we'd ask you to postpone the postpone the vote on the measure so that we can have a little bit more dialogue with the mayor's office and the council um, thank you for considering thank you very much um, and we are going to um, have Dan Decker, uh, your hand isn't up, you had it up and then it went down and just one last chance before I move on. I know you, there we go. No, oh, no, there it is. Okay, there were two of you, that's why I had to keep asking. All right, go ahead, uh, Mr. Decker. Oh, you have to unmute yourself first. There you are, Mr. Decker. You're all you're unmuted and ready to speak. Sherry, please start the timer. Ms. Dan. All right. Um, looks like we're having some issues with Mr. Decker. Um, we'll move on to our discussion and action items. Um, first item on the agenda is a resolution for a fireworks permit from Melrose Pyrotechnics Incorporated related to the Cooley Law School Stadium. Um, Mr. Falk, would you please go for it? Yeah, my name is Michael Falk. I'm representing Melrose Pyrotechnics and I, I work with uh, Tyler Parsons over at the Lansing Lugnuts. And, uh, uh, of course, the lug nut season has not occurred this year, but he's hoping to do some uh, movies in the park uh, on Friday and Saturday night, the end of this week, and try and get some of the people into the stadium, be able to enjoy some family-friendly kind of events. Uh, and he's got some plans as far as how they can do that and be COVID-19 friendly. And um, so uh, he would like us to uh, do fireworks similar to what we do at the end of a Lansing lug nut game. He'd like us to do fire those same fireworks shows at the end of the movies. And uh, so that is why I'm here before you tonight. For sure, um, the, we want to do August 28 and 29. I believe those dates have already been released uh, for the public. And uh, if everything goes well there, he'd also like to consider doing two additional ones in September, September 18 and 19. Um, but I don't think uh, uh, that's a for sure thing yet. He wants to see what kind of attendance he gets and uh, how it's received by the community. So. Uh, the show is uh, same as same company as always, same shooters as always, same uh, product as always. Uh, it's already been approved by your uh, fire marshal, um, and here I am before you today. Sure, and uh, Mr. Falk, thanks for presenting this evening. And Council, you'll notice that this is going to be on the agenda for action this evening, but also referral because you've not seen this before. Um, and this is a casualty of COVID. Um, I believe the, there was a application that was going through so that lug nuts could have fireworks after the games as they typically do throughout the year. Um, and then when COVID hit and the season got canceled, it kind of got gummed up. So the assumption was that these dates were already approved um, and it just never made it through our process. So when when the administration asked if we could consider it this evening, I said, far be it for me to be the Grinch who stole the fireworks and that we'd at least put it in front of council to make sure there wasn't any strong objection. So just so you just give you a little context for what's going on here. Um, so council member, would you have a question or a comment? 
Uh, yes, um, Michael, I'm looking at the diagram that was presented in the um, information that we have. You're launching inside the um, grounds, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We're launching from the same location as we have for the last two years. It happens in the outfield just beyond second base and uh, it's the exact same diagram that we've used for the last two years. And have we seen, um, based on the fact that you've done this before, any damage um, that has occurred to um, the surrounding areas that creates additional um, repairs that uh, the city has to take care of? No, there's been no reported damage or uh, any issues shooting there. Uh, I believe uh, several years ago, they used to do outside the stadium, but then there yes. was additional development there, which uh, prohibits that now. So okay. um, the product that we're using is mostly close proximity product. It's very clean burning and it's designed for close uh, proximity to crowds, similar to what is used in rock concerts, indoors, uh, indoor stadiums, that type of thing. That answers my question, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Wood, Council Member Jackson. Thank you, um, Mr. President. So I guess I have a couple concerns and they're basically pretty simple. The first one is I would like to lean against or to dissuade gatherings, if you will. I know you said it's gonna be COVID friendly and I'm sure it is because people are taking those measures all around. But you know, if everything else is relatively equal, I would try to trend away from it. And the second thing is, it's gonna be hard for me to vote to add some fireworks, um, especially just hearing from a lot of residents all year, pretty much, especially 4th of July and summertime about just fireworks going off outside of the current um, ordinance times. So if you have any comments to just address both of those things, I'd be open to them, thank you. Are you referring that question to me? Sounds like he's, yes. Um, yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, yeah, so you, well, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about the COVID-19 then pre, um, precautions and- I, I think I that they have been doing some events concern. there uh, already this summer. Uh, he's limiting the amount of attendance that's, that's allowed in. And uh, I can't speak to all the precautions and the measures that they're taking to be COVID-19 compliant, but I know that they've been doing some things and they've been working on that to make sure that everything is proper and safe. Um, I think it's just an attempt to try and get started here. Kids are going back to school and they wanna try and get back to normal if, if they can, um, even on this limited basis, kind of a trial run. Um, as far as noise, I can't really, I know that there have been complaints of people shooting illegally throughout the summer, but I would hope that that wouldn't uh, hinder us from being able to do pro, you know, professional displays in the future. Um, but I understand what you're saying there. Um, uh, if you have additional concerns uh, regarding whether or not sh it should be allowed for, for COVID-19, that probably should be addressed directly with Tyler Parsons over at the stadium. Um, he could answer your questions better than I can as far as what uh, measures he's put into place. I'm mostly just focusing on the fireworks and making sure that those are done in a safe manner. Thank you, I hope Mr. I, Folk. Yeah. I hope I answer your question. I'm going to kick it over to Deputy Mayor Harkins just to see if she has anything to add to this. Thank you, Mr. Folk. Thank you. And I would just add, I, you know, I'm a downtown Lansing resident. I can see the fireworks from the stadium um, from my front porch. And I will say, Councilman Jackson, you are correct. Um, this summer, especially around the 4th of July, there were a lot of complaints about illegal fireworks. But to my knowledge, we have never had complaints about the fireworks in the stadium. They're a pretty limited duration. Um, they've always been pretty um, successful. And it's not like they continue to go off late into the evening. And so um, we have not heard um, complaints about those in the past. The illegal ones, absolutely. And I made the um, quip last week that I prefer the ones at the stadium as opposed to the ones that are in the street directly outside of my house, which I think my neighbors would concur with, so. That's my Jackson, you all set? Thank you, sir. Uh, any further questions from the uh, council? All right, thank you, Mr. Falk. You have a good day. Oh, wait, nope, nope. <laughs> okay, well, have a good day, Mr. Falk. Okay, is there going to be a vote or? Yeah, there will be a vote, um, and then there'll be a vote at council this evening um, if it goes through this committee. All right, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, thank you. Um, so with that, I will ask um, Ms. our vice president to please make a motion on the resolution. 
Sure, President Spadafore, I'd move the resolution for a fireworks permit for Melrose uh, Pyrotechnics, Inc. Um, to display fireworks at the Cooley Law School Stadium. Very good. Um, Mr. Jackson. No, okay. Nick scratching your head with that, that blue hand. Um, okay, so we got, uh, we got a motion in front of us. Is there any discussion on the item before we move on? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Betts? Yes. Council Member Hussein? Yes. Council Member Wood? Yes. Council Member Spitzley? Yes. Council Member Jackson? No. Council Member Dunbar? Yes. Council Member Garza? Yes. Council Member Spadafore? Yes. Motion carries 7 1. Thank you, everybody. Next item, uh, we are continuing on. If you recall back, we had a slate of reappointments that we um, decided to interview. Um, so there are still, some of those are still in Committee of the Whole and we had some trouble connecting with Rodney Singleton in the past. So let me see if Mr. Singleton looks like he is. Rodney, is that you? Um, is here and he is being reappointed as an at-large member to the Board of Fire Commissioners with a term to expire in four years. Um, in 2024. So um, if Rodney, if that was the right Rodney on our, our guest list, if you'd like to either unmute and turn your camera on or just unmute and address the, commit, the co committee, typically what we do here is give you just a quick opportunity to introduce yourself, maybe speak briefly on your um, desire to continue your service on the Board of Fire Commissioners. And then if there are any questions from the council, we'll take those and then move on. So Mr. Singleton. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, my name is Rodney Singleton. Um, I lose track of when I was appointed. I think it was uh, oh, about six years ago, I'm thinking. Um, anyway, um, I'm a former chair of the fire commission. Um, I've enjoyed my tenure on the commission. Um, we've as of the last year or so, been starting to get a little bit more involved in things. And so we're kind of undergoing a little bit of a, I won't necessarily say a, a restructuring, but more of a reawakening, you know, about the things that um, we should be doing as a fire commission. Because, you know, honestly, previously before, there just really hadn't been a lot of issues that we were addressing. You know, it was pretty mundane stuff ordinarily, but. Um, now things are getting a little bit more involved and um, I'd like to see it through. So uh, let's see, I'm, uh, I'm a retiree from the state of Michigan. Um, and I don't know what else, I'm, oh, uh, pre-COVID, I uh, had a business, um, Blessed and Highly Flavored Catering, um, which is really kind of just on pause right now until uh, things open back up. So. Other than that, any questions? No, uh, not from me. Let me see. We've got two council members, council member Spitzley and council member Wood. Council member Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. So um, I was intrigued by your comment um, that you mentioned, you know, that, um, you know, a lot of you, you guys, the commission is, is tackling a lot of new things. And so in following up on that, I mean, one of the things that I think um, you know, we're hearing is some of the concern um, and some of the allocations on the, on the fire department and um, with some staffing there and some of the staff. And so I, I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, how you see the commission's role in, in addressing some of those, those allegations of discrimination. Well, you know, honestly, Ms. Spitzley, that's what we're trying to determine now. Um, the charter says that we, as a commission, um, have a say in disciplinary matters. That was written a long, long time ago. And now you got personnel issues that kind of cloud that. You know, we're not allowed to, you know, know who did what and, and what the punishment was necessarily, you know, so 
there's only so much we can can do as a board. So we're actually trying to, to define ourselves how involved we can get in these things. You know, we see these things going on all around us. And, you know, frankly, I feel a number of times I've been blindsided, you know, during, you know, I, I think I was still the commissioner or the chairman of the commission when Chief Tyler Farrell left. I heard about that in the news. I didn't hear about that from the administration. I got that from the news. Same thing with um, with Chief Mackey. I sat on the interview panel. You know, boom, I hear it in the news. I, now, in all fairness, there was a, 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 an email communication sent out um, from the mayor's office. But I heard about it in the news before I heard about it anyplace else. So, you know, as a as a commission member, you kind of feel a little like ambivalent, like what, what am I really doing here? You know, if we can't really affect anything or have any effect on those types of issues, you know? So like I said, we're trying to define that ourselves. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I also appreciate the fact that um, the language in your charter. I, you know, we had some of the same questions for um, Dr. Carnegie as he uh, came up for um, his reappointment to um, the police uh, commissioners. And, you know, I, I think that it is something that I would urge you to take a look at your charter, take a look at the direction, and, um, you know, are you willing to take a look at the charter, take a look at, at at what it says to um, be a voice on the commission um, to, to look in these things. Because oh, absolutely. In fact, we've, um, I think there were some meetings or is, we're planning a meeting or have been seeking clarification from the city attorney's office on, on that issue. So no, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, we're, still, we're still digging. We're still trying to figure it out. We just uh, we just elected a new chair of the commission, and you know she's got her ideas on how she wants to, um, I guess I would say steer the commission. But um, you know it, it, we're we're still kind of I think getting used to to Zoom meetings and remote meetings and so forth too. So you know all part of the process, I guess. All right. So I guess I can't ask you. Do you have an update on the search for an interim fire chief? Do you have any? I I haven't heard a thing since um, Chief Mackey um, resigned. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Spitzley. Um, Councilmember Wood, then Councilmember Hussein and Dunbar. Uh, thank you, um, President Spadafore. Hi, Rodney. It's Carol. Um, Hi, Carol. It, yeah, it's good to talk to you. Um, you and I have talked uh, previously about um, the commission over the years since you um, served on there and even as you served as um, chair. Um, I know one of the committees um, that are part of the um, Fire Board of Commissioners is um, at the hiring committee, which is part of an interview process um, that has commissioners that sit on that, that go through um, and rank um, people as they're going through the interview process. Have you ever sat on that committee? I did, yes. I sat on the last one. Can you tell us a little bit about how you feel that that works and, and whether you believe um, you're seeing some of the diversity and things um, coming through as, as you're looking at potential hirees um, for the fire department? Well, let me let me backtrack. Um, that committee that you spoke of, it's not a commission committee. It was through HR. Okay. Okay. And but you had commissioners, if I'm correct, you had commissioners that that sat on that. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I was like okay. I said, I was one of them. I sat in in okay. through several interviews. Okay. And regarding your question, um, how I felt the process went, I thought the process was um, quite efficient. Um, I think I, I, I kind of left, it left me feeling like the process kind of leveled the playing field. 
Um, there was diversity within the interviewees. I don't know how that turned out with this last batch of hirees, though. I can't, I can't tell you how that played out. Um, you know, in the end, we all, as a, as a, as a group, it was usually three of us, scored each candidate on their answers and um, just, you know, their, their overall, what we thought of the person, how they presented themselves and so forth. Um, well, one of the um, other things that was um, brought out in last year's um, budget process was that the fire department was going to develop a cadet program similar to what the police department had. Has, do you, has that been developed yet? It has not been developed. We are still talking about it. And then lastly, you know, as Patricia talked about um, the um, new chief and, and things like that, I would encourage based on, you know, the fact that you do have the ability to make recommendations um, to the mayor, you said you sat in on the interview panel, I would hope that the board um, would reach out and have a meeting with the mayor to determine how those next steps are, are going to um, progress um, with that. So, okay. um, and then um, I know one of the other concerns for the commission has been the equipment um, and making sure that you have the funding uh, for the necessary equipment. I know we've approved a couple of grants and a lease agreement for a new ladder truck. Mm -hmm. um, have any of those been put into um, place yet? Um, I, as I recall, the ladder truck is on order and I'm, I'm thinking it's due to go into service, I wanna say October okay. or, or I'm not sure, but it's, it's, it's in the works right now as we speak. Terrific, thank you. That uh, concludes my questions, um, okay. President Spadafore. Thank you. Uh, next is Councilmember Dunbar. Thank you. I was just wondering if it wasn't privileged if the city attorney wanted to um, chime in on what Rodney was mentioning about what their role can be as a board in issues that are coming up as of late. Well, it's found in the charter. And basically the, uh, as far as the fire chief is concerned, the permanent fire chief, the, the board has the ability to make recommendations to the mayor for the uh, mayor's final uh, approval. The, um, <clears throat> And it also goes for suspension in terms of uh, recommendations. Um, other than that, there are the uh, adoption of administrative rules, policies for the department, approval of a budget that's uh, recommended uh, each uh, fiscal year. Uh, pretty standard along the lines of the uh, police department and the police commissioners. When we get to the issue of discipline, we run into the same issue that you run into in all charter provisions. There are Supreme Court decisions in Michigan that collective bargaining provisions supersede charter provisions with respect to discipline. So if there are collective bargaining agreements that set forth a procedure for discipline, <clears throat> then those provisions in the collective bargaining agreements prevail. Uh, provisions regarding taking citizen complaints, those are similar to the police department. But basically administrative rules, policy, budget, um, and the uh, approval of the, or recommendation for the, uh, the head of the fire department. Does that answer some of the questions that were asked? It does, I'm wondering if it answers what Rodney was asking. Uh, yeah, that clears it. That that pretty much clears that up. Um, you know, so so anything that we might hear, like I said, when we when we get information, for one, it's usually secondhand. Um, 
And I guess my main thing too is that, I, I, again, I'm not the, ch the chair, but I try to, I've always thought there's no place for us really as a board in the political arena, you know, because we're citizen representatives and we may have our own particular po political um, um, affiliations, but, you know, sometimes when you get involved in some of those things that tend to be disciplinary, especially, you know, when it gets into um, racial matters, you know, um, I, I think that's a slippery slope for a fire commission to get involved in. So, you know, we, we may have our personal opinions, but I think as a commission, I don't know how, how, how much or even if we would dare venture into wade into that 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 whole thing you know but that, i'm just speaking as an individual that's how i feel mr chair may i add a comment here um sure. rodney you mentioned uh, consulting with the uh, law department we have it uh, we have an attorney plus a backup that's who are responsible for the fire department. And anytime any commissioners have questions as to counsel, they can come to us and we can discuss those, those issues. So it's not like we're aloof from the board of commissioners or any individual commission commissioner. Thanks, Jim. C council member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this isn't so much a question, just a brief comment. And it just has to do with what attorney Smirka mentioned about how disciplinary matters for both police and fire are, are basically driven by the collective bargaining, which apparently overrides the charter and allows, it sounds like to me, allows everything to just be non-public and we have to go to close, it's closed negoti negotiations. We have to go to closed session to talk about it. And I just don't know if it's ever public. So that's just one of my, some of people's concerns is just how that goes. And I know that a lot of people, we all support collective bargaining and a lot of you know power goes behind that. But when it comes to the transparency and we, how, how, how long are we gonna take, you know, it's private or whatever as an answer. So that's just where my head's at. I just wanna put it out there, thanks. Thanks, Council Member Jackson. Um, Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. I guess I, I want to, I mean, we're all, I think we're all on the same, you know, going down the same road on this. I just find it, um, you know, the fire commissioner, they hire the fire chief. They also deal in policy and procedures. And so for me, um, I don't know if it seems to me that at least one fire commissioner, and we're speaking to him right now, was not aware that they were able to avail themselves of the city attorney's office to get um, information on this. And maybe I'm wrong on that. But then the other thing is, you know, I think, um, Rodney, I think, you know, what I'm looking for is, you know, a little bit more accountability from the commission. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that, you know, absent the collective bargaining that, that the charter does give you um, a lot of um, authority to, to look at um, issues and to be very involved in what's going on. Um, particularly when, you know, if, if you can recommend a fire chief, um, I agree with uh, Councilmember Wood, you need to reach out to the mayor's office to talk about what the process is. Um, but um, I, I also think that going forward, I am hoping that, you know, you work with the city attorney, you work with your chair and you work with the other commissioners to find out what exactly the commission's authority is in developing policy and in looking at these, these, these things and move towards, um, you know, building policy and stuff to address them. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to, you know, step into that role and I mean, uh, you know, I, I've been in an, in an advocacy role before. That's not, it's not anything new. So I'm, you know, I'm more than willing to do that. Like I said, I just, 
don't um, I don't want to get political. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you know, keep, keep it in mind. Right is right it's and wrong. Political is wrong. appointment. Get, so I say, it's yeah, a political I'm not, appointment. I'm not arguing, <laughs> but it is a political appointment. So <laughs> I'm not trying. I, I don't mean for you to be. Um, I, I don't think that you need to be political to ask the questions. Um, oh, you're and you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. And you're right about me not knowing that we did have that liaison, because like I said before, the board really did not have any major issues to deal with where we had to seek out any legal advice or legal counsel. So this, you know, all of this stuff kind of became new to us and really made us start taking a closer look at things and what our role and responsibilities are. Okay, um, Council Member Dunbar. Thank you. That inspired a follow-up question for me. Rodney, when, when you got the answer from the city attorney, were you relieved that you are sort of precluded from getting into that realm? Or were you looking for ways to, um, to find a way to, to speak out in that realm um, if needed? Well, actually, I was sitting here processing that whole answer and trying to decide, you know, um, whether that was something that is still pursuable, you know. Um, you know, Mr. Smirka sounded pretty definitive, but then I was um, actually relieved to hear Ms. Spitzley say what she had to say. So, um, yeah, I, I, I um, no, I, I wasn't relieved to be, to be, you know, uh, uh, off the hook, you know, because like I said, I think that um, had we taken a more active role in some of this stuff, that we may have been able to avoid some of this, some 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 of the acrimony that's going on right now, you know. But but none of this was brought to our attention until after the fact. Okay. Well, I I'm gonna. You know, obviously, not wanting to be political has has different connotations to different people. Um, this is a political appointment, as it was said earlier, and I, I I really look for someone in this role that will um, not consider it political to stand up for what's right, even if it goes against the grain. Um, I think sometimes political gets um, conflated with uh, conflict and difficulty in that regard. And um, if what I'm hearing is correct, your ability to step into that role might not always be without conflict. Um, but well, it's I'm, I am I am no stranger to conflict. Don't get me wrong. You know, um, I like I said, I'm a retiree. Um, I worked for the Board of Water and Light. I, you know, I, I left there with a uh, uh, pension. Um, I've worked with the state of Michigan and, you know, I've dealt with conflict in, in, in both of those organizations, whether it was on the job or as part of the job, you know, because I was in regulatory with the state. So, you know, we'd often come in conflict with people. So, no, I'm no stranger and nor am I shy. I'm not, I'm not scared. Of, I'm not afraid of conflict. If that was the question. Well, I am, so. Oh, afraid for everybody here. Kathy, I'm sorry, Councilmember Dunbar, are you all set? Very good, thank you. Um, this is not for you, Mr. Singleton. It's more or less along the lines of just sort of a statement. It is surprising to me that we would allow collective bargaining agreements to be negotiated that are in conflict with the city charter, regardless of state law. Um, it, would, it would appear to me that even um, that the charter should be the guiding principle under which we operate for everything, um, including collective bargaining agreements. So, Jim, while I appreciate what you said, and I don't, I don't discount that you're, I, I, I believe you're right. You know, you're, you're a smart guy, and I trust you. It just concerns me a bit that we would negotiate processes that are in conflict with the charter, or at least would be at odds with the charter. Um, and that has nothing to do with Mr. Singleton's appointment. So, I'll stop talking now, and then ask if there's any other questions from the council. And seeing none, uh, Sherry, would you please call the roll? Before you do that, though, Mr. Singleton, thanks for being here this evening and for answering our questions. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. And thank you for your service. Yes, thank, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
President Spadafore? Yes, Mr. Uh, Vice President. Hughes. Oh, you need to make the motion, don't you? We do need. We do need. <laughs> to, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, with that said, I would move the resolution of reappointment for Rodney Singleton. Uh, this is for an at-large position on the Board of Fire Commissioners, and the term would be uh, set to expire June 30th of 2024. All right. Well, that now has been made plain. Would uh, the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Is that a yes? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Council Member Wood. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Motion carries 8-0, and this is on the council agenda for action tonight also. Yes, Mr. Singleton, because this is a reappointment, uh, you will not need to take the oath of office again. So if the council approves it this evening, you're just automatically extended to 2024. All right, thank you. Thank you for your time. Yep. All right, the next item is item C, and I'm gonna vamp while Greg Venker turns on his camera and microphone but it is a resolution introducing and setting a public hearing for an ordinance amendment to the property tax exemption guidelines. Mr. Venker, the show is yours. Oh no, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, um, can you see me though? I don't think so. We cannot see you. Great, wonderful. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is the, uh, okay. There is a section in our uh, property tax uh, exemption ordinance that lists a certain type of income uh, and that type of income, which is specifically uh, refunds or rebates um, uh, from prior property tax assessments, uh, has been determined by uh, the Michigan Tax Tribunal and uh, Courts of Appeal to not be uh, valid income that we can count when we are making a determination of uh, whether someone qualifies for um, exemption from uh, real property tax uh, under the ordinance. And so we need to remove it. And that is what we are doing. Is hey. that exciting enough? It was very exciting and well explained. Are there questions yeah. for Mr. Venker about this ordinance? We, I see Council Members Dunbar and Jackson. Why would we even want to have done that in the first place? We should have already removed it for our people. Uh, interesting, fun fact. Um, for a long time, almost, well, a, a large number of municipalities did count that as income. And um, part of the confusion uh, comes from the fact that the federal government, the IRS, still counts that as income from a taxable income perspective. Um, and so there was, uh, beyond just, uh, a philosophical difference of opinion, um, there was, uh, I guess, um, precedent uh, that from a tax analysis perspective, you count that as income um, because it's money that comes back into uh, uh, someone's pocket uh, at the end of the day. Um, and the city was not, the city of Lansing was not directly involved in um, litigation of this question, um, but other municipalities were and uh, at the end of the day, the answer is it needs to be taken out. Um, and I'll, I'll just note that since the case uh, came down and then a state tax commission guidance uh, also came down directing everybody to stop doing this, the city has not been including that in, uh, the assessor has not been using that as part of its uh, analysis at all. Um, so, but this is a necessary and important formality. All right, so in summary, we are aligning law with practice is that is that an accurate statement correct after after aligning practice with uh law <laughs> got it chicken and egg here so uh council member hussein then spitzley you know mr baker i may have missed it i get the um the the property tax credit return piece um there's a second piece i believe that removes the requirement that the applicant own and occupy a principal residence having a true cash value, which is, uh, I think the exact language is less than the average true cash value of all principal residence properties in the city uh, based on previous year um, values. Is that just aligning with um, current policy as well? What, what is that? That is, 
uh, a less exciting piece that came out of the same state tax commission guidance. Um, they, and give me one moment. Um, I am pulling up the bulletin um, <clears throat> that regards this. One second. The, so that final piece, credit is not to be considered the asset tax. Right, so um, that the value of the principal residence um, is, wait, hold on. Okay, wait. Oh, the owner occupy. Um, it's the, the 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 question is the. It's that uh, threshold about the true cash value, which is less than the average uh, true cash value. There was a, a separate uh, opinion that was talking about, or that essentially says that that uh, uh, that is not supposed to be relative value is not a part of the uh, analysis anymore. If that makes sense. Does that make sense, Mr. Hussein? I, it, I, I'm, I'm reading it and I can get into a lot of boring details, but essentially there was a, a <clears throat> that because of the variance in value of property across the state, especially that proves to be a very slippery target um, to try to say that someone may or may not be uh, adequately impoverished um, to be exempt if um, their home is worth more than the median value of the surrounding properties if all the other median if all the other surrounding properties have a depressed enough value um and so that's also being recommended to take out and so we're taking it out thank you uh council member spitzley thank you mr president so and i don't i, I guess i you don't have the people on here but i'm just wondering um you know, how does this impact our general fund? Um, almost, well, fu functionally, not at all. Um, and I say that because uh, the, I guess, revisions in the recommendations of the State Tax Commission, which our assessor is essentially bound to follow, uh, and uh, changes in uh, law coming down from courts of appeal saying you can or can't do things a certain way. We have to do it that way. Um, and I know that uh, in my communications with uh, Assessor Frischman, um, she has been following these practices for both of the, the current and the prior uh, uh, tax years. So um, to the extent that anything has changed, it has happened already. Um, also, anecdotally, I can say that this, these two changes have not significantly shifted uh, the number of people that do or don't qualify for uh, uh, exemption, uh, a poverty-based exemption from real property tax. Thank you, Mr. Franker. Uh, Council Member Spitzley and um, Council Member Hussein. Uh, Rob Whittigan, our new finance director, is that correct? <laughs> He's the new finance director is on. If uh, Mr. Franker's answer to that question did not satisfy your, your inquiry. I'm fine. I would, okay. I would suggest that the I would think that it would be a comment from the treasurer instead of the finance director, but that's just me. So well, I have Rob for you, so you know. Deal uh, with would, it, Spitzley. I would likely agree with Councilmember Spitzley, but uh, I could take notes and get back with you as soon as possible. Okay. So, I'm I'm good. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks for thanks for popping in, uh, Mr. Whittigan. Okay, um, I think it sounds like we've we've set the question. So uh, the resolution before us tonight is actually just setting the public hearing on this uh, res on this ordinance change. 
for September 14th at 7 p.m. via Zoom um, still. Uh, so, Mr. Vice President, would you please make the, the motion? Sure, I would move the resolution. The motion that's been moved. Um, any questions or comments? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Garza? Yes. Councilmember Jackson? Yes. Councilmember Betts? Yes. Councilmember Hussein? Yes. Councilmember Wood? Yes. Councilmember Spitzley? Yes. Councilmember Dunbar? Yes. Councilmember Spadford? Yes. Motion carries 8 0, and this is also on council tonight. Yes. Uh, and that is again just for setting the public hearing. The next item is uh, item D, the Montgomery Drain Special Assessment. This is public improvement phases one and two. Um, and let me remind folks that phases one and two, um, this is where council formally tells the department to finalize the plans and specifications and to work with the assessing department to determine the assessment role and the properties specifically impacted by it. Um, I, phase three comes on August 31st, assuming this is passed this evening, where uh, we set the public hearing on the roll, and um, you'll see that roll in the packet next week if we go forward and set uh, move move through these phases this evening. Um, so uh, for this, I had a note who was going to be speaking on it, it is uh, Mr. Kilpatrick, who I think is here, and also uh, Mr. Leffler, who I just made a panelist. So. Mr. Leffler, welcome, welcome back, Mr. Kilpatrick. It's nice to see you. Thank you. Um, for those that have been on council for a while, this is the same process we follow for, you know, essentially sidewalks is really what we do this for. This is obviously a much larger project and a little bit different because the city is not running the project, but the Ingham County Drain Commissioner or actually the Ingham County or the Montgomery Drain Drainage Board, I guess officially who's running the project. but. Council, when they, uh, back in 2014, there were a number of resolutions on this, and that was actually under, I think, county drain law. This is done for the city process. So the first two steps are, again, to set the need, and then we really can't move forward with anything else until the assessor is directed to create the role. Council has already, or will with this, I guess, reaffirm a, a previous discussion and action regarding whether 100% of this would be passed along to the residents or 50%. And so that you see that in this resolution. So we would move forward with 50%. And then prior to the 31st or on the 31st, we would get you that, that role that would then we would hope move forward with having the public hearing. So that could be discussed with the residents and the property owners that would be affected by this project. Got it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kilpatrick. So before um... We move on to Council Member Wood's questions. Um, do Mr. Leffler or Mr. Kiefer have anything to add before we do that that you think we need for our deliberations? This is Mr. Leffler, no comment at this time. Okay, thanks, Mr. Leffler. And uh, Mr. Kiefer didn't unmute, so we're gonna move on. Council Member Wood, question. Oh, there he is. Uh, sorry, Council Member Wood. Uh, Mr. Kiefer, did you have anything to add? I'm sorry. I know uh, Greg uh, summarized, uh, uh, Andy summarized it is fine. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Sorry, Councilmember Wood. All right. Thank you, President Spadafore. Um, this question is to uh, Ms. Harkin. Um, I know that the mayor had put out um, either a press release or conversation that said that he was asking the drain commissioner to hold off on this as well as to get some additional bids, um, is that still his position? I believe so. I would actually, I'm looking at Mr. Kilpatrick because I know he's been pointing on this. I do think that is still where we are, but I want to double check because he's been leading in all the details. So yeah, the city did approach the drain commissioner and as well as I think there were other folks that asked if this project could be put on hold. There were, um, some efforts made to reduce the cost. They worked with one of the contractors to reduce the costs and take some things out of the project. For example, there are some areas that sewers were going to be replaced and now they're going to be just lined. So that is a cost reduction, but the information back from the, basically the drain, uh, the drainage board was that the project would move forward. It's an essential project. And they thought by delaying it, costs might actually go up because interest rates are low right now. So um, as far as I know, everything is moving forward on this project. 
Well, I guess my question would be is if the mayor still has that um, recommendation, why would council move forward on this at this time? So I guess this could be a question for law, but if the project moves forward, regardless of what action city takes, we will be getting the assessment. And then we just are just trying to decide whether the city pays it 100% itself or passes along some of that. So if, if we don't do anything over the next couple of weeks, we will just get that assessment. And then that'll be up to the city to figure out how to pay that 100%. Councilmember Wood, too, I had this conversation. It sounds like that <clears throat> even though it is the desire of many of us on this body, I had a, I had, my, I had a conversation with others as well to, to delay this project. The drain commissioner and the, the drain board, it sounds like, has decided to have decided to move forward regardless of our desires. Um, so the bill comes due either way is kind of how I understand it. Then my next question is, is this was being discussed during the budget process. I talked repeatedly about having conversations, especially with the neighborhood. I knew that there were conversations with the businesses. I was assured that those things were gonna happen listening to the residents that um, chimed in as part of the committee of a whole and some that we've received emails from. I'm wondering if you, Mr. Kilpatrick, can explain to us what communications have been held to try to um, meet with the residents. And I realize we're talking COVID and I realize the limited amount of, you know, um, number of people getting together and things like this, but you know, it does have an, uh, a huge impact on them. Can, can you give us an idea how you have dealt with some of the residents that are gonna be impacted with this? Sure, well, so far um, there's not been direct communication with the property owners. We've had meetings, as you pointed out, with the business owners and those that have contacted us, um, you know, Again, we can send information out. I guess the difficulty is this is, it's we pay for the project, it's not our project. So yes, we can send information out to all the affected property owners, but as has been discussed already, affecting the project, the city will not be able to affect the project. It's really the Montgomery Drain Drainage Board that can make any changes and stop the project. So yes, we can send information out in advance of anything for the public hearing with information, point them to the website, hold any meetings. Um, however, as far as the, the trajectory of the project, it will not affect the project itself. I fully understand that, but we are making a determination of what they'll pay. That, that is our responsibility. So we will, is be we will be determining that. And without having had that communication, you know, with the residents. And, and I realized there was a lot that was put out with the businesses. There were several meetings that drain commissioner had with the businesses um, to listen to their needs. And we can't for, force the drain commissioner to do anything. I get that. Um, but I would think since we're talking about our residents that we would want to have more communication. Now, I'm not saying that whether at this particular point, whether I would support or not support us moving forward because there is a public hearing process, but I would hope that somewhere during this whole process that there would be better communication with the residents. Understood. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Wood. Um, we got a few more folks, Council Member Jackson. Um, then next will be Council Member Dunbar. Thank you. I just wanna echo Council Woman Woods. Um, comments and just add that Chris Umflett, Tim Whelan, and Dan Decker sound like very reasonable people. And it would be nice to have them included because I do also remember having conversations about how it should or could be split and the different factors. It was very reasonable, but I guess I didn't realize that, you know, they weren't included for that part. So I just want to also confirm. So when we vote yes or What's, what's set in stone, not the amount, just that the public hearing set to discuss the amount? Supposedly. No, not even then yet. So the, what will happen tonight, and Mr. Kilpatrick, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, basically, you're going to go forward with 
deciding what the role looks like and then presenting a role to us Monday for then us to have a public hearing on later in September for that role. The public will then have an opportunity once they're notified of that assessment to appeal that assessment to the committee of jurisdiction. And then that committee will deny or approve those appeals. And then the final role will be placed on the winter taxes after all the appeals have been considered. Is that correct? And going that is, forward. That is the process. Correct. So right now it essentially is basically saying we feel that there's a need for the project and just reaffirming what was done in 2014 and then directing the assessor to move forward and prepare a role that then can be, um, you know, have public input on that role that's proposed, which is just proposed because council actually sets whatever that role might be and can change factors and amounts however they they'd like to. Okay, thank you. And then one question I have, I'm sorry, there's other people in front of me. Um, was that, are you all set council member Jackson? Okay, thank you. Council member Dunbar. Okay, you have the gavel, you get to jump. <laughs> just kidding. Um, with regard to the question that was asked about delaying this process and, and whether or not we can convince, which I doubt that we are ever going to convince it to be delayed. What I heard um, Andy saying was that whether we vote or not vote, we're going, the city itself is going as an entity is going to be assessed. So at that point, if we were to wait, let's just say we did nothing with this and, and, and we were to wait, then do we have the ability to go through the process of assessment um, when you get the bill or is that a completely different um, scenario? Like, I mean, how would that different differ from us doing it now versus us doing it when the bill comes my understanding and Jim can weigh in on this or Rob is just a matter of timing because um, bonds are going out now interest will accrue and so the city would be paying those bills at least the first installments before we would have revenue in you know from anyone we would be assessing for this you're mentioning Jim Kiefer correct because yes that is an issue Jim uh yes yeah, so uh Mr. Kilpatrick properly described that the, the drain commissioner has already started the project. Uh, the drainage board has assessed the city for 64% of the cost of the project, and the city's bills are going to arrive. Uh, regard, the bill will arrive here to the city regardless of when we take action. So uh, we are going to have a bill, and um, we're just going to figure out how we uh, collect revenue to pay that bill. So I guess the, the, the question that I have to off council member numbers is if we don't do something with an assessment, we have to pay it out of the GF, the general fund. Right, and we would pay more out of the general fund until we're getting this through the assessment process if we chose to the next time. So yeah, I, I pay whatever interest accrues until we would get payments. Yeah, I remember researching this several months ago um, and, and the I think that what we concluded was that the cost of materials um, was going to be uh, significantly higher in the future for this. So I understand that we set this. And for those who are concerned about it, the, the opportunity exists to come and speak at the public hearing. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember Spitzley. I, I, I get I get the whole issue about, you know, issuing the bonds now and the price will go up. I get all that. But I seem to recall when we were talking about this, one of our primary concerns was to the city of Lansing. I get that this is the drain commissioner's uh, project, but we have a responsibility to our residents too. And I think that one of the things that I had a concern with is getting out early and often and explaining this to people and how this was going to impact them. I also, you know, and so when we have folks coming to us and we've got folks in emails and everything else um, expressing concern about the Montgomery drain and what their assessment is gonna be, then that tells me that we haven't um, done the outreach. The city of Lansing hasn't done the outreach. I get whose project it is and I get that it's the drain commissioner's project, but again, these are city of Lansing residents. And if they're going to be assessed dollars, um, they need, we need to do a little bit more outreach than the public hearing that's coming up. And, you know, we, so that, that's my concern. 
Um, the other thing is, you know, have we decided how we're going to do this, how we're going to do this assessment, or is that coming up as well? I, I was still, I'm still not sure how this is all going to be assessed. So as far as the final assessment and approach, that is something that, again, it's a proposal from the administration to council. Um, that has not been finalized with the amounts yet or the percentages. We had an approach that was presented by the drain office and we're reviewing that and trying to update that. So we may or may not recommend the same approach they followed. Um, I think as all of you realize, uh, whatever approach we put forward has to be defensible because we will have folks that challenge that. And so we wanna make sure that it is fair it is proportional between the commercial properties and the residential properties. There are some of these properties that are 100% in the district. There's some at the north end of Frandora Hills, quite honestly, that are only a fraction in the Montgomery drainage district. And so we're trying to figure out what is the best approach for that, because even though their property is only a portion in, they use the rest of the neighborhood and the streets and everything that else, you know, else that's a portion of that. Um, so once that is finalized, that's part of the reason why we don't want to put information out now of what the assessment might be because it has not been finalized yet. Um, and the reason that at least when the media was contacting us early and um, they wanted information, it did not make sense to put something out there one way that came from the drain commission and then we might decide something else because then there are multiple numbers out there. So we really want to be clear on that. And um, once we finalized how to assess that make council aware of our thought process that we went through. And then if council wants to change, you know, how they would propose to do that, they at least will have some knowledge about exactly how we came upon the numbers we have and some of the credits that are due for people that have rain gardens on their properties and factors that we're using to come up with that. Okay, um, and, I, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Andy. But to me, you know, that, that to me, tells me that we need to put the brakes on this. If we haven't decided how, if we haven't got a recommendation yet of how this is gonna be assessed, of how, you know, and count, we haven't got a recommendation, how then are we supposed to be going out to the residents and giving them information when we don't, we haven't really decided what we're gonna do. And I, and I get that it's the drain commissioner's um, project. It's just, it's it's frustrating. So I, let's, I'll just throw that out. Speaking, I just want to touch piggyback on what Councilmember Spitzley said. Um, Jim or somebody, what did we do in the budget? We passed a resolution as part of our budget that set the assessment rate and set the, the special millage rate. Didn't we decide that in March? I'm confused then if, if I'm hearing that. If, if council members aren't aware of that, I'm confused by it because it was definitely in the budget or maybe it didn't, it wasn't as formal as I thought it was. Jim, can you answer that? You set the 50% amount that that's what you set you did not set a policy on exactly how individual parcels okay so we said 50 percent would be done through millage and then the, assess the assessment role has to come after the final amount comes okay yeah and the assessment role really can't be formally prepared until you um you know tell the assessor till we do today till we, til we do what we, so, we're supposed to do today right correct yeah. okay right. okay um council member betts Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I've had uh, numerous conversations with the constituents over in this area on, on this particular issue. And one thing that they're really concerned about is uh, the mayor's office did not approach them to have a conversation about the 50-50 split. And that is one thing that they um, are questioning. And technically they have a meeting with the mayor next week. So I would propose if we can, this is a question that we need to ask finance and I wish Judy were on here, is what this would look like if we postpone it for a week or or I guess two weeks to address this issue and to actually meet with the constituents before we start taking votes to, as Andy said, reaffirm this 50%. Because we as council don't need to reaffirm this from what I understand. And I would like the, the constituency to be able to have a conversation with the mayor's office on this, as opposed to us taking action on this today and then possibly having to revisit this after the mayor's talked to our constituents. So that's that's my thoughts on this. I guess my, my question is, anybody in finance, uh, can we postpone this for a couple of weeks so that they can have the meeting with the mayor? So I've got three, mute, three unmuted, so who wants to go first? Brian, looks like you want to say I something. 
Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the concern and definitely want to have, and we've certainly met with some of the constituents in that area over the past six months in terms of getting the information from the drain office to understand how the project was being bid and then final numbers and things like that. Um, in terms of the clock of starting the process, I would encourage you to stop, uh, to start that process of asking for that final role so that um, ultimately when there is a question from a constituent, we can actually ask, you know, answer their question of like, how much is it going to be? And as Mr. Kilpatrick was saying, they're essentially reviewing uh, that make sure that the parcels are fairly assessed based on the um, type of parcel that they have and things like that. Um, and then also too, the, the, and I think I'll reiterate this and you know, the finance director, Mr. Whittigan can say this too, is that um, tomorrow the drain, Montgomery Drain Board is essentially selling bonds to pay for the project and interest will begin from the time that those bonds are going to close and and essentially you will, the city will be receiving a bill and there, the, it'll be up to the council how to appropriate that to um, the drain, uh, drain, the drain code tax and then to the individual parcels. Um, it is set for right now for the drain code tax to start on the December 1, 2020 tax bill. Um, but I think we are very, uh, I mean, uh, the team and with the administration and with uh, yeah, Mr. Kilpatrick and everybody, we've been, we're ready to start working and, and answering the public's questions and be ready for that. Uh, and as we had mentioned before, we were getting information by parcel so that we can actually see the difference between, um, you know, not 100% is going to be uh, paid by those people in the, or the parcels that are in the Montgomery drainage district. So there's, there is going to be that split. So um, definitely we'll make ourselves available to answer any constituents question. Thank you. Council Member Betts, you all set? So uh, thank you. Um, Council Member Hussein, you're up next. Vice President Hussein. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm actually just forgetting to put my, my oh. hand down. I will say I, will say, um, I had tried to insert myself after Councilwoman Spitzley's um, comments and I wanted to address the fact that during budget, what we did obviously was we approved the 50% uh, assessment to the affected property owners and and what what we need to do at some point obviously is is give the the public uh, service department uh, the go ahead to work with the uh, the assessor's office so they can actually figure out the specifications to actually set the role so that we can start to have informed conversations uh, with the folks over in Frandora Hills. Um, I, I guess my question, um, since I have the opportunity, uh, President Spadafor, is if we were to set, you know, my understanding is that uh, if we were to go ahead and pass phase one and phase two tonight, uh, that we'd get information at the close of the week and then we'd actually be setting the public hearing um, on August 31st. When would that public hearing be set for? And then I have a follow up comment after that. Well, so that's up to council. I mean, really what we're the earliest that could be would be September 14th. Um, and you can ho obviously hold the public hearing two weeks from you know the, the 31st and not take action for a while, depending on what the comments are that, that come back. Um, this just kind of sets, sets the process in motion. And until the assessor is directed to prepare the role, we really can't have those informed conversations on what the role might look like. We could speculate, um, but I think that's, that's the step that regardless of when it is, needs to be taken. And it really doesn't make sense to start to have those speculative conversations until we have a role before us that we can really look at. And and, and I would agree. Um, I guess my point is, you know, if, if at the earliest the public hearing is going to be this uh, September 14th, I think what that does is it allows us time uh, to work with the administration, work with the ward representative and, and at large representatives as well to put something together uh, so that we can deeply and, and in a meaningful way engage those folks over there because they certainly deserve that engagement transparency. But uh, that being said, um, I, I guess I tend to think we do at least need to get through this phase one and phase two so we can start to have uh, the, the important conversations that need to be had. Thank you. Before I move on, can can someone address the question that I think we're circling around but haven't quite gotten to yet is about what's the, the, the drop dead date to approve the final roll to get it on the taxes in time to avoid an uh, un unanticipated cost, regardless of what the roll looks like. So if we decide to change the roll, whatever, what's the last date possible to get those on the on the winter taxes? Not everyone all at once, please. <laughs> Brian, go ahead. 
Minor thing is so the drain co tax is scheduled to be assessed on in the in the December one tax bill. So essentially, fifty percent of the revenue would be coming in. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Kiefer, though. But um, essentially, it's like uh, once the final the council decides the final roll for the assessment by parcel, then ninety days after that is when the a separate assessment bill would be going out to each parcel or taxpayer for those parcels. So if the September 14th date, the public hearing is held and that's the final day, then 90 days after that would be when uh, uh, when the payment would be coming due essentially. And so, um, but I'll leave it up to Mr. Kiefer in terms of other timing. So this is a special, it doesn't go on their taxes? It's not an assessment that's paid through the tax uh, process? This, 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 uh, it will go on their taxes, but it's just, uh, I'll let Ke Mr. Kiefer also explain it, but in compliance with the ordinance, this, the first year of the first levy is a little bit odd because it's so late in the calendar year. Um, but next year, it would all be on the same cycle of essentially a July 1. Okay. And that's pretty much by ordinance. So that, that's the correct description of it. under your ordinance. Um, the, the cadence is tonight is the first step where you direct the assessor to prepare the special assessment role. If you go forward with that, uh, the, the assessor would prepare that role, you would then schedule a hearing on that role. Uh, as Mr. Kilpatrick said, the earliest yet could be, would be September the 14th. It could be later than that if you want to. Um, and then following that role at some point, um, perhaps two weeks after that, you would confirm the special assessment role with whatever changes council decides to make. If you assume that that hearing is on September 14th and you confirm the role on September 28th, under your ordinance, the first installment is then due 90 days after that. So that would then be the end of December. Um, the following 29 installments, that's your first installment under the 30th, the following 29 under your ordinance would then go into summer taxes starting with the summer of 21. So um, I know we have others that want to, but I want to continue this thread real quick, Kathy and Carol, sorry. So if we, there is no real rush, I suppose. I mean, tonight, obviously, I understand we should probably move forward and get the, get get a, get a role established so that someone, that the public have something to respond to. But absent um, action on the 31st, we could push this out a few weeks to get some more feedback and, and and decide deliberate a little bit more on on the exact role once we have a role to respond to and as long as we do it before july 1 of next year we're not really well probably before july 1 but it doesn't have to be done by december to get on the tax bill in the first year because it's not a, it won't be on the tax bill whether we do it tonight which we can't, but whether we did it tonight or December 1st, it, it would not make it out of the tax bill. It would go out as a separate bill to the assessed property owners for 2020 or I guess 2021. And in the interim, the special drain millage, or if we're calling it that, um, if that goes, that's going in effect on December 1. So that should bring in some revenue to begin making payments. So we're not putting the general fund at risk by, by delaying the conversation by a few weeks or a month or so once we get this this sample role this role established for the for the residents to respond to. Is that is that a fair um, political way to avoid making a tough decision next week? Is that I see laughs. I see I see smiles. So as I, far as my I think that's, I think that's, that's a correct. fair assessment. Uh, okay. Council President's metaphor. I think that's good to start that understanding. Um, as Mr. Kilpatrick would say, there's five steps, and this is essentially step one and step two. And again, um, once people see what the assessment uh, is going to be, or 50% of the total cost is going to be to those parcels, then they, they certainly can have the information that they need to even to address and even council to address back. So, okay. yeah. Thank you, uh, and I'll, I'll, that, that answers my questions about timing and, and risk to the general fund. So, uh, Kathy, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Councilmember Dunbar. Or Kathy, um, my question was really, and maybe irrelevant now, but I mean, the conversation that the public was hoping to have with the mayor was about the fifty percent, not about the actual amount. Um, so, I guess you know, I'm just chiming in with everybody else that we need to move forward on the PI, uh, PI one and two and um, 
and, and deal with that so that we have a cost so that we know what 50% is. Yeah. Well, and, and we, and we made that determination with the budget that we're, we're doing the 50% in March, right? Yeah, we yeah. did. Uh, Councilmember Wood. Wood. Uh, thank you. Um, isn't it my understanding, Andy, that you prepared something for us to look at when we were looking at this during the budget process? Um, there were figures per parcel. Um, how much different is that compared to what you're asking to move forward on? Not significantly for the commercial properties. Uh, there's discussion on, you know, the, the residential properties. There's kind of two schools of thought, um, and this is kind of throughout the state, whether they should be assessed based on the actual acreage or if residential, no matter what the size is, they pretty much have the same benefit. Um, so that more on the residential parcels, there could be some, some changes. Um, there are a couple other things that we noticed in the role prepared by the drain when they sent it over to us. There are some I would call them commercial residential property. So I think they're zoned multifamily residential, but they have single family houses or duplexes on there. And so there's a decision to be made there, whether those should be treated as commercial properties, which means they get three times the amount, the, the factor we use is three times, or if they should be assessed more like a residential single family home. So it's really more on the residential, but if you change how some of that residential is assessed, that does affect the commercial properties slightly. Then my next question is, Brian indicated that they had been meeting with residents. Can you tell us what residents you've been meeting with, Brian? Council member, uh, if there were any uh, inquiries uh, from emails and or the commercial district, primarily the commercial property owners were asking us for feedback of the process uh, and we gave them um, links to the Montgomery Drain Board information at the county's office in terms of seeing when coming in. So you've not met with residential properties? No, no residential okay. other, other than we heard of, of inquiries. Thank you. And then lastly, no matter what, on the December tax bill, the entire city will receive that portion of the tax added on for Montgomery Drain minus the special assessment, correct? The 50%. That's correct. In the budget, it was 0.26 mil, which is about 50%. Thank you. You're welcome. So, oops, sorry. Councilmember, are you all set? Yeah, thank you. I had one or two questions, I guess, um, one for Brian and then one for someone with a law degree. Um, so first, Brian, unless you have a law degree in this question, the next one isn't for you. Um, so the question that I have for you is what happens if that 50 percent, you know, we, we, we heard a little bit about the ability to cost value engineer this down a bit. Um, but what happens if the 50 percent, the 0.26 mils doesn't cover 50 percent? Do we then have to go back and raise the millage rate? Is that what would happen? Uh, that would be up to council how they would want to cover um, the the remaining portion and when um, there would be possibly a timing issue um, as related to that. So uh, if council decided to put 100% of this assessment as a drain co-tax like the 0.26, um, there still could be time to change the 0.26 for the December 1 levy if you wanted to. Usually, about, um, there's, there, there would be time. You'd yeah, have to work with them. my concern was like long term. What if you know tax value drops and we're not collecting? And is it it's, it's a longer term concern about that fifty percent? Oh yes, um, if taxable values do drop, yes. Uh, the thought would be is that we assumed essentially no growth in the tax base for the next thirty years, which oh, is okay. probably, so we did a little bit more conservative approach. Okay. Although then my next question. 
Yeah, we'd have to pay it out of general fund or figure out another way to do it. Okay, so then my my, my last question, I promise, is related to um, some inquiries we've had about excluding certain parcels from the for the drainage district and special assessment district. There seems to be some bit of dis dissension among some of the answers about whether we can exclude them from the special assessment district, but not necessarily can we because they're in the drainage district. So Jim or I know Greg has done a lot of work on this. If Greg, if you're still on, if you if you're comfortable answering that question, my question is the legal ability for us to exclude a parcel or parcels um, based on um, you know residential versus business, those type th that type of those type of factors. Let me start out and get into the whole. You can't be arbitrary and capricious. I mean, there are there are a lot of cases on this issue. When we look at the role, we're going to have to look at these issues um, and, and whether or not there's equal protection. I mean, it gets down to whether the parcels are benefited or not. And to exclude on, exclude on reasons other than that a standard, it puts us into jeopardy. And so we would look at the latest cases and do an analysis of the special assessment role. Greg, you can pick up if you get more on that. I think you've answered my question, at least unless someone else needs more information. But Jim, you've got you you've you've answered my question. Oh, Brian Jackson, I think want Greg's to Greg to elaborate. Uh, Greg, you're not off the hook. Oh, thank you. Um, can we oh, exclude sorry. based on income or or poverty threshold line, all that stuff? That's not one of the protected classes. Yeah, I, I would say no offhand. We'll look at the issue, but I mean, it, the standard here on special assessments is benefiting the property. And it's got to follow all the constitutional protections and you've got to show an objective benefit to the property. I'm not aware of that poverty, Greg, applying to a special assessment. No, no, uh, poverty, poverty is not one of the factors that can be considered. It, it is literally, does the piece of land benefit uh, from the improvement being made, wherever the improvement is. And then if the piece of land does benefit, um, you, generally you have multiple properties that benefit, then you have to apportion it, uh, uh, apportion the cost to those properties uh, to the same extent, I mean, to the same percentage essentially of the benefit they receive. Um, and I, that's what uh, uh, Mr. Kilpatrick was talking about previously regarding you know, two schools of thought about how you assess residential properties versus commercial properties. Um, commercial properties generally get, uh, I mean, depending on circumstances, generally get a portion or a larger apportionment. They pay more because they have a lot of impermeable land on them um, from a drain analysis perspective, for example. Uh, but it's fairly complicated. Uh, and the, again, one of the biggest pieces is we have to make sure that it's fair and you have to make sure that if you're going to include some benefited properties, you have to include all benefited properties, um, excluding or counting out benefited properties at the cost or uh, at the increased cost of others is going to be a, frankly, a successful challenge at the end of the day. And Andy, I know Mr. Kilpatrick can speak to this uh, uh, too. And if I've said anything incorrect or overstated a position. It doesn't no. appear that he's looking to correct you. No, that, that is correct. And, you know, I think what we're trying to do is follow what is typically done around the state on similar type, either projects <laughs> or um, Ann Arbor, for example, has kind of a utility, a stormwater utility. And so we're looking at what, what they've done. There have been other challenges to stormwater utilities. So we really need to make sure that the approach we take here is defensible because there will be challenges, I'm anticipating at least. Okay, and, and rounding out this discussion is the representative from the first ward, Councilmember Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, one last question. I want some clarification here. On one hand, I've heard that the 50% is settled, that there's nothing we can do because we voted in the millage rate, yet I've also heard that we can change the millage rate and perhaps change the 50% assessment. And today we are reaffirming that 50%. So if we we're to vote yes on that 50% today, there is no way for us to change the roles to reflect a different percentage later. Is that correct? So voting on this today, is that setting in the 50% beyond what we've already done? Or is this something that we can revisit in the future? If, for example, our constituencies come back to us and say that the roles are unacceptable to them. 
Mr. Leffler, our town is, I mean, sounds like what I've heard is we've decided with the budget to do the 50%. This role would demonstrate to the taxpayer what that 50% looks like. We'd have to vote to change the millage rate, the special assessment, I'm sorry, the drain code tax rate before December to change it if we decide to go in a different direction. It's not set in stone though, and this doesn't set it further in stone. Is that an inaccurate portrayal of what's happening? I'll defer to Mr. Kiefer, but I, I'll wait for what he has to say. But I would think that if you wanted to do a 50-50 and you decide to pay the second half or the assessment by a drain code tax, by hiking the tax, that's that's up to council. It's just it's just a source of revenue. So, Mr. Kiefer? So, so I would agree. I mean, council has the ultimate authority on this, right? So, uh, so far, our council said in the spring they're going to split it 50% by the drain code tax, 50% of the special assessment. Until you confirm the special assessment rule, which you know, may be sometime in September, you have the flexibility as council to change that. So you could um, change it at any time prior to confirming the special assessment rule. The longer you, you wait to change something like that, obviously it has further ramifications because the bill is going to arrive from the Green Commissioner's office regardless of what that bill. Hey, so if, if I could, a question for someone from the city attorney's office. I mean, this one clause about the percentage for our process to set the, you know, the draft role, is that something that is needed to direct as a percentage or is that something that just reaffirms the action council has already taken? Well, the Are question you? I have before we uh, even get to that answer to Mr. Kiefer is, do we have bonds that are going out there with this uh, covenant in them about the 50%? No, so the, the the drainage district is still in their bond based on their assessment to the city. And the, the drainage district doesn't care how we pay for it, whether we pay for it out of our general fund, whether we pay for it out of our drain code tax, whether we pay for it out of special assessment. So uh, the bondholders aren't looking to how we collect our, our revenue. Well, the 50% would set the... Uh level or, or the benchmark for actually determining the amount of special assessment for each property. Um, but that can be changed later, you know, could, before you confirm the role. I agree with that. Hey, I, I lied. We're going to end the discussion with council member Wood. Just for clarification, Jim, the council passed a um, budget, which included the, these, this information in it to change the rate that would go to the entire population would require a recommendation from the mayor, not from council. And because council can't arbitrarily change it themselves. Correct? Right, you'd have that. Uh, <clears throat> it has to be a budget proposal Correct. Uh, that comes from the mayor. Um, yes. Okay, just want to make sure we're all talking the same apples. About them apples, Jim. <laughs> all right, so we I need a resolution or a motion to approve the resolution to um, set this role and get or to direct public service and the assessor to, to uh, develop the role. And that is the resolution before us. So uh, Vice President Hussein. So moved. All right, we have the motion before us. Is there any further discussion on this item? Uh, I'll, I'll try to move to table this until our next discussion because I'd like the mayor to be able to sit down with the constituents before we vote on any more, any further um, process, especially because it sounds like we can wait a few weeks. Okay, um, there's a, mo a proper motion before us to table this uh, resolution. Any further discussion, any discussion? Um, but I'm just going to say I won't be supporting this motion to table. I'd be interested in possibly tabling next week's actions, but I think it is it behooves us to get the role established so that the residents have something to look at. Um, even if that doesn't end up being the, the final decision, it'll it'll start that process of public input. As you know as that my... that you've convinced me, I rescind my motion. Okay, it's been removed. Um, so uh, the art of persuasion is is alive and well on the Zoom meeting this evening. So. <laughs> We will have a roll call vote, please, Sherry. So this will be the roll call on the original motion by Council Member Hussein. That's correct. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Jackson. 
Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yep. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Motion carries 8 0. All right. Thank you all. Uh, next. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Okay, the next item, um, we're gonna talk about the next three in order or just kind of lump them together. You all are familiar with these uh, resolutions. They relate to setting public hearings for the, um, the ordinances respectively to uh, repeal the prohibition for 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. parking, to eliminate the annual and temporary permits for overnight parking and to regulate street parking during snow emergencies. Um, it was brought to my attention late Thursday evening that the clerk's office um, didn't notice those hearings. So we have to reset the public hearings and those public hearings will be Monday, August 31st, 2020 at 7 p.m., um, which is just a week from today. But so they were on the agenda for this evening, but they will not be considered this evening. So they will take them one at a time, but that's what those resolutions do. So um, Council Member Hussein. Sure, so I would move the resolution to reset the public hearing ordinance amendment uh, to repeal section 404.01, uh, which is the elimination of the prohibition of street parking from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. and that would be for August 31st. Okay, there is a motion before us. Is there any further discussion on this item? Hold on, I gotta move my, there we go. Uh, Councilmember Dunbar. So as, <clears throat> pardon my voice, as you said, that um, it wasn't noticed, and we are we're still we have it on the agenda tonight, but it will not be for action um, when it goes on the when we do this at the meeting on the thirty first. It's going to come back to um, the public service committee afterwards. Um, most likely, it looks like the September fourteenth. It will come back, and I'll say this again during the normal the regular council meeting. Um, and then we'll probably take action on it on September 21st. What I did want to add was we put in an inquiry to uh, the development office to make sure that we have an accurate count of who has paid for permits so far this year and um, where they are in the year, um, how that works. So if they bought it in May, is it good till next May? Because we're going to have to deal with um, pro rating uh, refunds for folks who, you know, there could be somebody who just bought a permit last week and we're gonna repeal this, and we need to put that money back in their pocket. So um, so I did put it in inquiry, we will talk about that in committee, but I just wanted to share that in case anybody's watching who, um, we are conscious of that and we are looking at ways to, to reimburse on a prorated basis. Thank you, Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember Jackson. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all the conversation and just to put it out there, cause I don't know when a better time is that I would, I would definitely sleep fine if we repeal all the overnight parking. I personally would, but at the same time, I'm not affected as much by it. So I would be open to a similar ordinance as long as people who show that they need a permit for the circumstances that they can't park in the driveway, then they can just get one um by the city basically free of charge so i think that would be a good compromise and i don't know where all the conversations come but i think there's room for it somewhere thank you council member jackson um seeing no further discussion um sherry would you please call the roll council member dunbar yes council member garza yes council member jackson yes council member Betts. Yes. Council Member Hussein? Yes. Council Member Wood? No. Council Member Spitzley? Yes. Council Member Spadafore? Yes. Motion carries 7 1 to set the second hearing for August 31st. Thank you. Council Member Vice President Hussein? Sure. President Spadafore, I'd re I'm sorry, I would move the resolution to reset the public hearing ordinance amendment uh, to repeal section 404.13 uh, to eliminate the annual and temporary permits for overnight parking. Again, this would be August 31st. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any further discussion on this. Um, would the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Batts? Yes. Council Member Dunbar? Yes. 
Council Member Jackson? Yes. Council Member Wood? No. Council Member Hussein? Yes. Council Member Spitzley? Yes. Council Member Garza? Yes. Council Member Spadafore? Yes. Motion car carries 7 1 to reset the public hearing for August 31st. Thank you. And finally, Vice President Hussein. President Spadafore, I would move the resolution to reset the public hearing again for August 31st. This would be for an ordinance to create section 404.12, uh, which would regulate street parking during snow emergency. Thank you. Um, no further discussion is noted. So clerk, please call the roll. Council member Jackson. Yes. Council member Dunbar. Yes. Council member Betts. Yes. Council member Wood. No. Council member Garza. Yes. Council member Hussein. Yes. Council member Spitzley. Yes. Council member Spadafore. Yes. Motion carries 7-1 to reset the hearing for August 31st. All right. So the next item, um, we're going to just briefly touch on it and then let everyone know kind of the next steps in the process. Um, we've talked a little bit about this, but budget priorities are due to the mayor by October 1st. I'm looking at Carol to make sure that I'm not wrong. Okay. October 1. And um, the way our calendar works this year is um, that actually means we have to get them submitted by about the 21st, unless we want to do a special meeting just for the budget priorities. So um, as of now, what I'm going to ask folks to do is take a look at the budget priorities. We'll have a little bit of a discussion on the 31st and then committee chairs, obviously you have, le you've got a document here. If you want to have start a discussion now, please, please obviously do that in your committees. Um, but we're going to probably want to talk about this at COW as a, as a group. I think there's some of us that have expressed some interest in changing the way we do these budget priorities, maybe, maybe honing in on what few, few tangible purchasing priorities may be or policy priorities through the budget may be, and then submitting those to the administration um, on the 21st. So my goal would be to have that discussion on the 31st of August, um, and then the 14th, hopefully by then committees would have a chance to um, send their budget priorities to Committee of the Whole for um, sort of a compilation document exercise on the 14th and then final approval on the 21st. If for some reason a committee does not have the time to meet, before the 14th, um, that work could obviously be done between the 14th and the 21st and then incorporated as part of the, the cow discussion on the 21st. Um, and I'm not shutting the door on the possibility of a special meeting. I just know how taxing it can be to, to add another meeting to the calendar for one specific item. So that's it's, it's sort of like a, it's like a no <laughs> it's, is my preference. And I think many of you would feel the same way, but we, we shouldn't shut the door on if we do need to have something on the 28th, 29th or the 30th that we, we, we're open to do that because it is important enough. It's, it's one of the most important things we do is, is talk budget priorities. So um, I'll ask committee chairs to do with that information what they, what they think necessary, but just come prepared on the 31st. Wait, is that right? Yeah, the 31st of this month to have that discussion a little bit more robustly. Um, and if there's if there's suggestions for changes, bring those as well. So um, that is really all I want to talk about on the budget priorities this evening. If there's discussion that needs to be had, let's let's have that now. But otherwise, we'll we'll be prepared to take a, a 15 minute break for council. Councilmember Wood. Um, during the brown bag, we had talked about having um, council or council. Uh, clerk, um, Chris will uh, city clerk in to talk about voting. Yes. Um, and are you scheduling that for the 31st? No, it was confirmed for September 14th. Okay. When do ballots go out? Chris, Swope, if you're listening, text me when the ballots get sent, please. It's 45 days. Before 45 days from the election. I thought they came out that, that week, which is why we. Mr. Swope's telling me they go out 924. Yep. Okay, so we have, to, okay. Um, I'm starting to get inquiries from our senior citizens and concerns. And so I thought the earlier we can get him on the better. So I would, you know, if we're doing it on the 14th, that's that's fine. Yeah, that'll um, be 10 days out from the from the, the day the ballots are sent. Okay. Um, and the way the postal service is working, that should be about 30 days before the ballots hit the mailboxes. Okay. All right. Um, 
So thank you for that reminder, Councilmember Wood. I appreciate that. And yeah, Chris has confirmed for the 14th and he will talk about his efforts to expand um, access and ensure integrity of the vote coming into the November election here in the city of Lansing. Um, and Chris, since you're listening, thank you for sending me that message. <laughs> okay, so um, I see no further business for the council. So with that at 6.46, we stand adjourned until seven o'clock. <laughs>